Grace, mercy, and peace be to you from God our Father and our Lord and Savior Jesus the Christ. Amen. What makes someone great? What makes someone great? The disciples were arguing about this question among themselves because they wanted to know, I'm the best disciple of Jesus. I'm the greatest. Well, in order to get some sort of example of that, of what we normally think of, what would make someone great, we just look at the people that we raise up amongst ourselves as great. Albert Pujols. Maybe not right now, but is a great baseball player. Why? Well, for over 10 seasons straight, he hit 300 batting average, had 30 home runs, and over 100 RBIs for 10 seasons in a row. That makes him a great baseball player. And cue your favorite great athlete. They're great because they excelled over and above the norm, over and above the other players. What about Marie Curie, figure from history, significant woman in history. She received two Nobel Peace Prizes, and as far as I could find out, she's the only person, man or woman, to receive two Nobel Peace Prizes in separate fields of science, discovering and pioneering many things. The truth is, the great among us that we raise up amongst ourselves show it on the basis of their own merits, their own deeds, their own ability. And no doubt when the disciples were arguing about who was the greatest, they were talking along those lines, saying things like, well, I have been following Jesus for 10 minutes longer than you, or he called my name first, or he gave me this important task, which means that he really trusts me. That's how we compare and contrast. And before we get too judgmental about the disciples here, because it's easy to do that when it's written on the page, think about all the debates you've had about who is the strongest or fastest among your friends when you were a kid. Think about all the debates you had in school about who was the smartest, who was the greatest, who's the best athlete of all time. We fight about that stuff constantly. Even while I was looking for some examples of people to use, even the titles of all of the articles that are written about it or the lists that are made are like the most influential women in history, the most influential people in history. It's this game of compare and contrast by how much someone does. And in a certain sense, it makes sense to elevate that as something to emulate because these people did something extraordinary. But then we get to our gospel reading for today and the disciples who are arguing just like we do about who is the greatest. And Jesus has a very strange take. And when Jesus has a strange take, it means he's right and the rest of us are wrong. Is this what makes someone great. All the things they do, the number of home runs they hit, the number of tackles they've made, how many Nobel Peace Prizes you've won, how many awards you've garnered, what your GPA is in school. Well, Jesus doesn't think so. You see, the disciples, they're arguing, and you can tell they're uncomfortable with talking about their argument because Jesus asks them, And the text tells us they remained silent because they were arguing with one another about who was the greatest. They didn't want to admit to Jesus that that's what they had been talking about. Well, Jesus' answer, because he knows what they're talking about even though they didn't share it with him, Jesus' answer is really puzzling. And here is what he says. He sat them down and he called the twelve and he said to them, If anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. Huh. So, all of those historical pictures you've seen of kings and queens and the people carrying their trains or serving them food, 
According to Jesus' measure, those servants are the great ones and the kings and queens are less significant. That's an odd way to look at the world, isn't it? Turns things quite literally upside down. And he said to them, if anyone would be first, he must be last of all and servant of all. And then he pulls a child over to give them an example of what he means. You see, children cannot do things on their own. They can't live on their own. They need help. They're not strong. They're not independent. They can't score touchdowns. And then for a long time, they can't even walk. And Jesus uses a, such a child as an example as how you receive greatness by looking at the least among you and serving them. So greatness, according to Jesus, is the one who puts himself last and uses themselves up in service to others, in particular to the least. What does the world call such people? Those people are weak. They aren't worthy of praise. They get taken advantage of. They get walked all over. And often those people don't get their way. They weren't assertive enough. They should have insisted on being the first. And yet our Lord Jesus says this is how we are to see greatness. Now you might say, okay, okay, that's easy to say. But who really does that? That's easy to say, but it's hard to do, right? Does Jesus walk the walk and not just talk the talk? Maybe his disciples are thinking, well, give us an example of somebody like that. Which would be really funny because he just described to them the most glaring example of this teaching and they weren't listening. Let's hop back up to verse 31 in our gospel reading. Before we get to this whole section about them arguing about who's the greatest, Jesus describes the greatest act of all time, and they did not understand what he was talking about. Here's what he says. The Son of Man is going to be delivered into the hands of men, and they will kill him. And when he is killed after three days, he will rise. So let's kind of put that into power language. The most powerful being in the universe is going to be delivered into the hands of paltry, sinful, weak men. And they will kill him. And he'll die a criminal's death. And after he has died in shame and crime and reputation destroyed, after three days he will rise. But they did not understand the saying and were afraid to ask him. Jesus talks the talk. He does the very thing he's describing and challenging his disciples to do. And he does it in the most exaggerated example possible. The most powerful being by any standard you wish to measure. Becoming the very least subjecting himself to his own ungrateful and fallen creation, subjecting himself to the point of death. This is greatness, becoming last of all and servant of all. And he is calling his disciples and us to begin to see the world in this way, to begin to see other people in this way, to begin to see ourselves in this way. And this should change what we value. And it should change who our role models are, or at the very least, what we praise about them. It's fine to enjoy sports and praise people who excel at those sports. But Jesus is telling us it's more important if you find out that that person gives a lot of their money and their time to people that you would think they would ignore and people that most mostly are ignored. Some such examples of these sorts of role models are Mother Teresa, Oscar Schindler, people who've endured great risk, personal risk, who've 
subordinated their own well-being for the good of others. Peter, the other disciples, all ended up losing their lives in service to the gospel, preaching the truth of this message in hostile environments. Paul, sent as a missionary to the Gentiles, beaten and imprisoned many times, and eventually falsely accused and sent to Rome, where he was executed. Martin Luther, famous his, historical Christian figure in our church body and really all of Christendom, at one point he was asked why the Holy Roman Emperor, who had all the bearings of earthly greatness, the big fancy elevated chair, the best clothes, all of the might of the world, known world at his disposal, and he asked Martin Luther to recant his own writings. And Martin Luther's response is that my conscience is captive to the word of God. So unless you can prove to me that the word is saying something else, I will not recant. Which effectively meant that now the emperor would decree that he could be killed and there would be no consequence. These sorts of people strive they don't, none of these, even the ones we raise up, they don't perfectly answer this challenge. But they're beginning to see, like you and I and the disciples of Jesus, what real greatness is. It's a subordination of self. It's self-sacrificing life for the needs of those around us. Are you ready? Are you excited about being great in this way? I'm not. I'm scared. That's asking a lot to even give up self. It's something that sort of we gloss over now when we welcome new members or when you get confirmed. But one of the questions you're asked is, are you willing to cling to this faith in the face of everything, even death? Those are challenging calls. And I would argue that this form of greatness is much harder than being an NFL player and scoring an amazing touchdown. Because sometimes it's thankless, nobody notices, except for God. And you're going to go out and you're going to try to do this, and I'm going to try to do this, and maybe you already are trying to do this. And you also know that you're going to fail. You're going to stumble and fall. You're not going to do the thing you're called to do. You're going to live your life at times viewing greatness the way the world does and not the way that God does. So there's one more layer to this teaching that I think is extremely important for us to understand. And it's really important for each and every one of us to understand because you and I are helpless, weak, and small. And so Jesus is talking to us here, not just challenging us in the new creation as his children, as his disciples, but he's also speaking a message of unspeakable comfort. Because he knows that his disciples, you and me, are not going to be able to perfectly live this way, to be able to perfectly see others in this fashion. He said, Jesus. What Jesus describes to his disciples in the first part of this gospel reading is a message also for you and me. Jesus does the very thing perfectly that we cannot do. He gives up everything, his divine power, his majesty, his perfection, and even his life for you. Because in the eyes of God, you're great. Your weakness, your helplessness, your fragility are made perfect in the strength, perfection, and glory of Jesus. He did all of that. He gave up all of that for you. For a small, weak, and unimportant you. For the disciples that argue about who's the greatest and rather than pay attention to God. He did this for people who commit sexual sins who lie, who get angry and behave in petty ways. He did this for people who get angry and curse 
at other people while driving on the road, for people who get angry and inflict physical harm on others. He did this for people who deceive, for people who are greedy, and for people who don't always love. Jesus did the greatest act and is the greatest of all time because he gave up everything for the least of all. And he treated himself last to serve you and me. So yes, there is a call to be great through emulating to the best of our ability this self-sacrificial love that Jesus calls us to. But there's also comfort in the knowledge that Jesus did this perfectly for you and me. And because of that, you have been freed from everlasting condemnation. You've been freed to strive and fail and come and confess and receive that forgiveness and then strive again. So that you and I do not begin, like the world, to place our worth and our view of greatness in what we do and accomplish. Because no matter the accolades, no matter the achievements, we fall short. And when those days happen, the days where you don't do what you ought to do and you know it, the days where you don't feel very great but you feel small and you feel helpless and you feel like your life is out of your own control, on those days, remember the gospel message here in Mark 9. That in the eyes of God, you are loved and you are great because not of what you've done or not done, but because of what Jesus has done for you. In the name of Jesus.